So up to this point, we've learned about two physiological components of the cardiovascular system. We've learned about the microstructure of the cardiomyocyte, and we've learned about the cardiac action potential. Now what we're going to do is apply both of those principles into the excitation contraction coupling system. Now that sounds quite complicated, but it's really quite simple. What we're trying to do is link that action potential we've just learned about to the function of the heart, which is to contract like a muscle. So if we remember from before, we have um, an action potential that occurs somewhere in the heart and it starts to flow between all the cells because each cell is connected to each other, both physically and ionically. As it travels through, eventually it's going to get to a part of the cell called the T-tubule. The reason why it's called a T-tubule is because it's an imagination of the cell membrane or the sarcolemma and it has a, looks like a T. Now within this T-tubule, there are certain chemicals that make the ionic composition within this area is particularly different from where it would be out here. Within this area, there is a high concentration of calcium ions that resides in this area, which is great because when the action potential moves across the cell membrane up to the T-tubule, what's going to happen is, during phase two, calcium channels are going to open. Now this area is full of calcium, like I just said, so calcium rushes in to the intracellular fluid. Now what's really interesting is that as it moves from the T-tubule into the intracellular fluid, there is also a connection between the sarcoplasma reticulum. The sarcoplasma reticulum is just an area of the cell that is uh, jam-packed full with calcium. Now when calcium enters from the extracellular fluid to the intracellular fluid, it causes an, a channel within the sarcoplasmic reticulum to open. This causes calcium to be released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum into the intracellular fluid. So what you're left with is a massive calcium spark. Calcium can then interact with the actin and myosin within the heart via the sliding filament model to cause contraction. I'm not going to go into details about this, but I've got a link on the website for you to go to to find out more about that. But in essence, when calcium binds to troponin C, there is a conformational change in the tropomyosin to allow actin and myosin to bind and slide on each other to cause contraction. So now, well done, we've contracted the heart, brilliant. So we've got the heart to squeeze blood out, but what we need it to do is to relax and let it let blood re-enter the ventricles or re-enter the atria to allow another beat to happen. Otherwise you've got a heart rate of one and you won't survive for very long. So what we're going to do is move the calcium back where we found it and do the whole process in reverse. Okay so here is the, the uh, sliding filament with the microfilaments of actin and myosin that we were talking about. When you remove the calcium from there, you need to put it back into the sarcoplasma reticulum. This requires ATP to move it in. There's also calcium you can move back into the extracellular fluid, like where we found it. This is, requires ATP, but in, indirectly, in that you move calcium uh, out of the cell quite easily in exchange for sodium. But that sodium needs to move back out of the cell via the sodium potassium ATPase. So by moving calcium out, you're actually using ATP indirectly. So the point of this is that actually the relaxation of the heart is an active process, whereas the contraction of the heart is a passive process. So this is how you couple the relationship between the excitation of the uh, cardiomyocyte and the contraction of the cardiomyocyte.